I don't feel safe to have children in Texas anymore. It was very clear that my health didn't really matter, but my daughter's health didn't really matter. I was so sorry that I couldn't help her and release her going to heaven sooner rather than later. She had no mercy. There was no mercy there for her. That powerful, harrowing testimony was delivered during a two-day hearing this week on the legal challenge to Texas's abortion ban. One of the plaintiffs in the case, uh, Samantha Cassiano, even vomited on the stand while talking about her baby's fatal birth defect, which also put her own life at risk as she was forced to continue carrying her unborn child. Cassiano is one of 13 women who, along with two OBGYNs, are suing the state of Texas, demanding clarifications on the scenarios that would be considered medical emergencies and allow for a legal abortion under the state's harsh restrictions. Once the Supreme Court overturned the constitutional right to an abortion last summer, a Republican-backed ban went into effect in the state outlawing all abortions except to save the life of a pregnant person. But the procedure was already severely limited in the state following the passage of SB 8 in 2021, and that banned abortions at six weeks of pregnancy. So the vagueness of this current exception, saving the life of a pregnant person, has really left doctors afraid, scared, to perform even medically necessary abortions to save the life of a mother because the consequences of violating that law, including losing your medical license and facing up to 99 years in prison. And while this lawsuit is focused just on the Texas ban, several states are facing similar crises. About half of the country has now banned abortion or severely limited the procedure, leaving women and doctors with few options. Joining me now is Regina Davis-Moss, president and CEO of In Our Own Voice, a reproductive justice organization, and Dr. Uh, Wendy Goodall McDonald, a board-certified OBGYN based in Chicago. It's great to have both of you with us. Um, Dr. Goodall McDonald, I'd like to start with you. And one of the women who testified uh, this week, Ashley Brandt, she was pregnant with twins. One of the twins had a fatal condition called acrania. And the longer she carried the fetus, the more it put the other twin at risk. And we see clearly that abortions are a necessary part of reproductive health care. How common are these types of complications? And as we are now well over a year into Roe being overturned, what have you seen in your practice? So these kind of complications are extremely common. The unfortunate truth when it comes to pregnancy is that it can be just as beautiful as it can be harmful. One of the other plaintiffs in this case had a pregnancy that the, the cervix began to open and she was going to inevitably lose the baby, but she was not allowed and the doctors were not allowed to do anything to intervene, which put her health at risk. It actually made her um, go into sepsis, which is an infection that affect her, affected her entire body, including her uterus, and now may not only put her life in jeopardy, but may have, may have impacted her reproduction in the future. And so here in my state, we are able to treat abortion as healthcare because it is that it is life-saving it can affect not only the life of the mother but even of in this case of the twins the child that was to live and go forward so this it's it's really an unfortunate scenario that's taking can, place in texas can i just follow up on that really quickly if i can what do what do lawmakers you think what do lawmakers need to understand about how urgent this issue is i mean talk to us through um you know, the importance to have clarifications about exceptions so that abortions can be uh, made when they need to save the life of the woman. So the, the challenge with a lot of these cases is the, the legislation makes it seem as though the death or the harm to mom has to be like impending in your face. But we know as healthcare professionals that there are things that can happen in the coming days or weeks without intervention. And so what I think needs to come into this clarification is that not only does, do these exceptions need to take place for high-risk pregnancies, it needs to be understood that the life of the mom may not be threatened in the moment that you have to take these actions, but it could be that there are inevitable harms that if we don't intervene, we're actually putting the life and safety of mom and baby at further risk.
Regina, you had 19 Republican attorneys general asking the Biden administration to withdraw a proposed change to medical privacy laws that would ban doctors and nurses from reporting suspected abortions to law enforcement. In other words, they want the ability to continue prosecuting abortions even when it is outside of uh, their jurisdiction. Your reaction on how concerning this is? I mean, it is safe to say that women no longer have a right to privacy in this country, or at least in those states, and expanding in this country. Yeah, I mean, what we're seeing here is just another example of what we call reproductive oppression which is the regulation of a person's capacity to get pregnant as a strategy to, to control not only people, but communities and entire populations. And so when we see things like attack on um, health care records and the privacy, you know, those things are meant to protect people. And do doctors don't have to disclose that. And so when we're, we're venturing into things that are meant to protect us, but in, in fact, they're not protecting us. And I would say to those lawmakers, how do you, you're abandoning your citizens when they are dealing with life-threatening pregnancies. And this is a time that they really need you. So I'd, I'd say, you know, we need to hold our, our elected officials accountable, you know. And I also add that this is part, very much part of the lived experience of everyday women. You know, we saw those heartbreaking testimonies, but that's happening all the time, particularly for Black women. And that's why we have to continue to fight for bodily autonomy. And actually, Regina, I mean, it's, it's not just the laws that ban abortions, which are harming women. You know, there are also ones that don't allow for proper time off after women experience the loss of uh, their newborns. I mean, in Texas, uh, there was a woman who was denied maternity leave after delivering a stillborn baby, which added injury to an already incredibly devastating tragedy. I mean, she, she had to use up all of her vacation and sick time, receive short-term disability coverage in order to take the time off that she uh, needed to recover from this. And in this post-roll reality, what needs to change about these parental and maternity leave policies across the country? Well, we know that we need parental leave and we need that to be paid. We've, we've always called for paid parental leave because people need the space to, to care for their children, but they also need to need not worry about having to make a living wage and to be able to um, take care of and, and be attentive and fully present for their child. But I, I'd also add that, you know, but we're, we're not, you know, when we look at these things, we're, we're thinking about people, we're forgetting that these are people. We often focus on the statistics, but this is real trauma. And the reason that people need seek an abortion, it's varied, it's always urgent, but most of all, it's private. And so what we really want to make sure is that we're supporting people in this time when, they, when, they, when they've decided that right now, this is just too much for me. Yeah, and I, as I was saying earlier, I think one of the things uh, that we're seeing happen more and more is that, unfortunately, the privacy of women in this country is constantly being um, oppressed. Uh, Regina Davis-Moss, Dr. Wendy Goodall-McDonald, thank you very much for your time and your insights.